Hello everyone, this is Dr. Stubblefield. Um, in this presentation, we're going to talk about the basics of style. Style is a big term in composition. Um, I've got several books here. Uh, the Sense of Style, Steven Pinker. Um, the Writer's Style, you may see this. Um, a famous one by Joseph Williams, Style, Lessons in Clarity and Grace. Um, how to Write a Sentence and How to Read One by Stanley Fish. People write entire books about style. Um, the good writers use effective style. Um, what to, we're going to talk about today are the basics. We're going to talk about a half of a dozen things that you can do to improve your prose. Um, you know, they, there's there's different ways to do it. One way to think about this is that these are things that we would want to become habits. So we will discuss half a dozen things that we want to make habits in our writing. And at the end, we'll also talk about the mindset or the logic behind good style. Oftentimes, if you tell somebody just to do this, and here's an example, um, it doesn't make as much sense and it may or may not stick. But if you understand the logic of good style, the underlying logic, and you just simply adopt that mindset when you're writing, you may find that you will do these sorts of things that we discuss, and you'll also understand why somebody might want you to do that. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, the, the book on style and everything we talk about today will be found in a book called uh, The Elements of Style by Strunk and White. I mean, it's been around for a hundred years, it, it's like 30 different rules and it gives examples. It's been like the holy grail of style guides. Um, when I wrote my dissertation I, and, well, I wrote articles before and I've sent them to editors, professional service. I remember the first time I did this, they told me to go back to Strunk and White and reference Strunk and White. At the time, I think maybe I was, you know, gotten a little too big for my britches. And I felt I was a little bit humbled by this, but it kind of made the point that, you know, we, we really can't get away from it. Uh, you know, the foundation of good writing, it's a very small book. Maybe you'd want to purchase it. It's something you can look at. It really breaks down the idea of good style, things that you want to do with your sentences and things you don't want to do with your sentences. So we've been talking about the problem of sentence level writing. You know, that's definitely part of composition. We might have the content of your paper or the ideas of your paper would be one horn of the process. But the other horn is how you present those ideas and you want to present them through sentences that, um, you know, present the information in the best way possible. Now, I was thinking through this, there's really three things three issues with sentence level writing. Number one, your sentences need to be grammatically correct. Everybody already knows that, no surprise there. The second one is that your sentences need to flow together. You can write a bunch of grammatically correct sentences, but they don't fit together. They're just one disconnected sentence in a very choppy fashion, another disconnected sentence, another disconnected sentence, and you still won't be an effective sentence writer. But there's a third piece to it. Not only do you need to be grammatically correct and link your sentences together so that they flow well, but those sentences themselves need to be well written. And what does that mean? Well, that's what we hope to unpack in this presentation. But you really need all three pieces in order to be a good sentence writer. Grammatically correct, tie your sentences together, and write sentences that present the information as effectively as possible, that use language effectively and usefully. So as a quick review, we, we have talked about the sentence patterns. There's seven of them. Um, throughout this video, you may want to take notes, right? If you're like me and you listen to something, it sounds great, you feel like you're learning, but five or six days later, you can't rem you're gonna remember 10, 20% of what you heard. Uh, just simply jotting down some notes, stopping the video, doing whatever you need to 
would be a much better way to make sure you're getting the information. But we've already touched on these. I've insisted that if you learn these, you can avoid grammatical errors. You can write 100% correct prose. You can solve the problem that torments many writers that tormented me. Um, there is, you know, you can also have, have enough variety. If you have seven different patterns, when I used to grade AP exams, you could get a six, which was the highest score on sentence variety. Yes, you can expand from this, but in terms of the utility of learning these six patterns, it's very high. You can solve the grammatically correct problem, and you can have enough sentence variety to be an A writer. So I've insisted throughout the course, it's worth your time to learn these. We moved on from there, and we talked about paragraph unity, and we talked about flow. And the same thing I'm doing here. I'm not giving the end-all, be-all on how to tie sentences together, but I found the six most effective ways. Let's put a half a dozen ways out there. Let's familiarize ourselves with it. Let's start looking how other writers do it. Let's start connecting our sentences ourselves. So there's another presentation on this, but I've listed them here as well. Um, here is an example of flow where you can see in the second sentence a, uh, a pronoun is used where the reader's brain takes the previous information and makes a concrete connection by substituting the antecedent, uh, which in this case would be readers, into the word they. I insisted that, the, of course, flow seems like a subjective term. Your writing flows well. But there is a level of objectivity. You can ask, did the writer make a concrete connection? Um, and the answer can be yes or no. And I also stress that just simply orienting yourself to doing this when you write, understanding that there's a task to be done, puts you into the game of creating flow, and many people don't do it. Um, so if you look again, we can see that the word topic is introduced. Then we have but, which is a type of transitional phrase, and the word topic is repeated. Repetition is one way to create flow in your writing. Then we have a demonstrative pronoun, that, which refers to what went before it. It's going to be substituted as an empty container. The reader unconsciously does this in their brain, does make a connection. And then we, again, we have they, which refers back to readers again. So each sentence, it's like a tapestry, is connected. You can go overboard with this. Uh, but like I say, writing is an art, not a science. When I look at things, when I read books, you know, 90% plus, I can find one of these devices or some device that's connecting one sentence to the other, babying the reader, connecting their thoughts for them, making it a smooth, seamless experience. So this brings us to style. Um, the half a dozen things I came up with, following Strunk and White, omit needless words, prefer active voice over passive voice, prefer strong verbs over weak verbs, avoid unnecessary nominalizations, prefer concrete over abstract language, and vary your sentence structures. There's not going to be a lot to say on six. We've already discussed it. I'll simply talk about some reasons why you might want to do that. Now, um, omit needless words. A couple things about this first is I remember I was teaching writing and I became friends at a different institution with a, used to play basketball with this guy. He was the Shakespeare scholar. We're still friends today. He'd been teaching 25 years. He's a real smart guy. And I asked him, I said, what do you think the biggest problem that writers have today? <clears throat> and he thought, you know, too many words. And, you know, it seems like a simple thing, but oftentimes when we don't have command of language, it's very hard for us to say something in an effective way. We have to really work hard, and we end up writing too many words. And to somebody who, like, you know, my friend Paul, who's graded thousands upon thousands of papers and really knew his stuff, you know, you can spot it very easily. Like, this is some prose that is very weighed down. This is not effective writing, right? If it takes you 20 words to say something you could say in eight, then you're not, it's not considered effective writing, right? And um, the other thing is that 
Some of this is common sense. We want the most bang for our buck. Right? We want the most meaning with the fewest amount of words. Right? This is anything, you know, if you're getting a text message that's really long to get to the point, you're wow, maybe you have somebody who just talks and you start shutting down after a point, you know, and they could say it much more efficiently. Maybe you start watching a movie and you're just having to work too hard to get anything out of it. Or maybe you're eating food and, and, and you know, rather than just melting on your mouth, like the expression where you just, ah, it's such a pleasant experience. You're having to chew the food way too hard to get any enjoyment out of it. So this is not, it's not surprising that we want, you know, language used effectively. But what it does not mean, and then I have to stress this again and again and again, is that it doesn't mean write short, simple sentences, which sometimes you do. But even when I heard this, you know, my first reaction was to, okay, well, let me just keep my sentences really short, right, so I don't waste words. Right? Which, you know, you may want to write short sentences, it just depends, but this doesn't have anything to do with your sentence structures or long sentences or short sentences or anything like that. It doesn't speak to that issue at all. That's a whole whole separate qu question. And we do want you to use complex sentence patterns and convey complex thoughts, right? But your phrases and your clauses should be sharp. I mean, you could argue, especially if you want to write a 25-word sentence or something, right? Then you better make sure that you're not wasting words because if you don't, it's going to fall on its face. In order to write a long sentence that's effective, then you're going to have to really not waste words. You're going to have to really keep the, breeder, the, the reader's brain right, engaged and moving forward in, in it with sharp, lively language that's connecting thoughts and not giving unnecessary information, which would cause it to shut down. And so this is why we're getting this kind of mindset about what you're doing when you're writing a sentence, I think is very important. So it does not mean write short sentences. And not that short sentences are needed sometimes, it's just a, that's just a completely different issue. So the, the buzzwords become clear and concise. You write clear and concise, you know, and, and um, every word should tell, right? And, and uh, White is, so sorry, Strunk here is emphasizing, again, it doesn't mean you have to make all short sentences or that you avoid detail or that you just don't go deeply in anything. It simply means make your words tell. Every word should be doing something. If you have a 10-word sentence and three or four words aren't doing something, that's not a good reading experience for me. I did the work and I got nothing out of it. All right, so we're told to omit needless words. We need some strategies of how to do that. Um, the first thing, I think, is to use your own logic. To really just ask yourself, number five, if you can say something in fewer words and still retain the meaning. I mean, that's the key. It's not a good edit or fair edit if you change the meaning. Can you keep the same meaning and simply say it in fewer words? Right? You can always say it in fewer words if you change the meaning. Um, or, but anyway, it, it's... Can you say it in fewer words and retain the meaning? So we have the first thing we talk about is pruning redundancies. Redundancy happens a lot. I use it a lot. I think when we're speaking, it's common to say things like, I just read a biography of her life. Nobody would think that that's odd. We're just more relaxed. It's more informal. But when you're writing, I, we've talked some about how writing requires different things than speech. Uh, you need to be more precise, right? Uh, you're asking more of the reader. And, you know, a biography, it's redundant. A bios actually means life in Greek. Graphe means writing. So, it, you know, saying a biography of her life, of her life doesn't add anything. It, it's, it's redundant. It's unnecessary. A consensus of opinion. You know, I, Again, I think all of us might say something. We need to reach a consensus of opinion here. But we could just as easily say we need to reach a consensus because what that means is, you know, 
uh, an agreed uh, agreement of opinion. You know, a majority agree on a certain topic. Uh, it's implied that it, it takes opinions into consideration. End result, free gift. I mean, like, you get a free gift at the end of this. Well, a gift means that I don't have to pay for it. If you gave it to me, right? So, again, it's a mindset thing. I see them a lot. I was just grading papers yesterday. There, there are a lot of them. We all do it unconsciously. And a lot of this comes in at the editing stage. If you really get, there's always that what you have to weigh. If you get really uptight and really cramped, you're not going to write your first draft well. Even the idea of free writing is trying to make, just let your thoughts go. Um, but, you know, after you've been through the editing process, it'll start to get into your first drafts. You'll start to develop habits. You can be somewhat conscious when you're making your first draft, but definitely at the point of editing, you can sit there and when you're looking, saying, could I say this in fewer words, one of the things you'll run into is redundancies. A period of four days, personal opinion. We can know if you say, you know, opinion that, it, that it's yours. We know, you know, four days is a time period. So you're essentially saying it twice. We can reduce clauses and phrases. Um, take a look at the example here. Smith's College, which was founded in 1871. Right? Um, that uh, can be turned into a phrase and simply say founded in 1871. Um, that is a reduction of two words, which is not huge. Uh, but it's still more efficient way to say it. It's the principle that's important here. Uh, citizens who knew what was going on. I think we can probably already say who knew what was going on is not an efficient way to say something. Can't there be a word that says that? Citizens who knew what was going on voted him out of office. That's 11 words. Uh, knowledgeable citizens voted him out of office. I don't have my glasses. Is that indeed? Yeah. So, so there we can move from 11 words to six. And I highlighted that because again, you may say that's not a huge deal if you wrote this one sentence like that, and, and you would be correct. Oh, I wrote one sentence like this. Um, come on, I, I'm a stylistic uh, idiot. No, you're not. You know, one sentence. But, you know, there's a better way to say it. And you have to think, so if you were to write with these sorts of habits a paper, in the first style, it would take you 11 pages. If you would write it in the second style, it would take you six. Would that make a difference in terms of readability and the reader if you were making them work twice as hard? You, you gave them an 11-page paper that you could have said in six. You're in the category. It's very hard to say, I don't think anybody can, that that's good writing especially when you understand your task is to give the most bang for the buck. If that's what you're trying to do, and you hit 11 pages when you could have hit six, then you missed the mark by, by a considerable amount. So again, it, you look at these in habits. If you're doing this type of thing all the time, it's, it, it's going to build up. If you're not using languages efficiently, and the reader is going to be getting tired, and they're going to be sensing they're not getting much out of this. And the thoughts and the ideas aren't being conveyed effectively. And they're going to be right. All right, we can look here. Um, unencumbered by a sense of responsibility, Jason left his wife with 49 kids and a can of beans. Oh, wow. Jason irresponsibly left his wife with 49 kids and a can of beans unencumbered by a sense of responsibility, right? You're weighing down unnecessarily there, and it's a habit that you don't want to get into. All right, ineffective clauses and phrases, just to continue from the previous slide. I mean, due to the fact that is a big one. Almost always you can say it because, in spite of the fact that, right? Um, that's just a very wordy phrase, and there's lots of them like that. If you, if you scrutinize them, you say you know, that. But it, it, you get a lot of those sorts of wasted words. I've heard them called verbal cellulite before. I don't know if that's, I hope that's not an offensive phrase. Um, 
but your white your writing is going to be weighed down. It's just not doing anything. You're, you're sort of, as the old adage goes, talking loud, saying nothing. You're saying nothing with a lot of those words. And that's what we don't want to do. We want to make every word count. Um, in my opinion, as far as I'm concerned, these fall into a certain category. Uh, Richard Lanham is a well-known author on style. He talks about, you know, he calls them winding up. You know, we see this a lot when students are trying to compare language, trying to write an essay. It's very much, in. it is my opinion that, you know, guns should be outlawed. Where we're, you know, get right into it. You know, guns should be outlawed because this, we know it's your opinion that you're the one that's writing the paper. This is, this is, but there's this winding up before you get into a sentence, right? You're trying to do it right. You're trying to manage your ideas and, and it's hard to do. So you're, you're really winding up. And oftentimes that winding up can be completely eliminated. Just get right into your sense. If you understand that you're there to convey information effectively, most bang for bang, you can see that I don't need to, I don't need to wind up. Again, this is not saying don't ever use I or my opinion, but there's a principle at work that I'd like for you to see. And um, it oftentimes, right, there's winding up is just superfluous. Right? I just ate some food that didn't have any taste or didn't give any nourishment in my body. It's one way to look at it. Another thing when we talk about omitting words are these expletive phrases. An expletive is not a profanity. Um, and it's not a bad word. There are, and it is. It's kind of a winding up as well, right? There are 25 students who already expressed a desire to attend the program next summer. It is they and their parents who stand to gain the most by the government grant. You know, 25 students have already expressed the desire to attend the program. They and their parents stand to gain the most by the grant. There's no need. The introductory there are, and it is, which for some reason are very common to want to say it. We can say it before almost everything. And we just say it, but it doesn't do anything. So again, it's the principle that's important and, and it's a good example of that principle. So omitting needless words, which could be argued is the biggest one, uh, which is also another way to use language effectively, requires orienting yourself. What are you there to do? You're there to give as much information possible in the fewest you know, words that makes the reader do the least amount of work. It's like I say, baby the reader, right? Give it to them in the easiest way as possible. Don't make them work for 11 pages to get six. They're not going to like you because that's just humans. Nobody would like, you know, having to spend... Uh, an hour in the grocery store to get what we needed when we wanted to spend 20 minutes. It's like this in almost every area of life. So, um, <clears throat> so not only do we need to eliminate or reduce ineffective expressions, we also sort of need to choose the right word. There are certain word choices, and, uh, and style is often word choice, or but that end up causing excess words end up going against the principles of good style that we're going to flesh out a little bit more as we go. And one of them is use active over passive voice. Prefer. Doesn't say always. Sometimes you need the passive. Sometimes the, you have to use the passive. Sometimes, in rare cases, the passive is preferred stylistically. But as a general rule, prefer when you can the active over the passive. Uh, the dog is fed by Thomas is passive. Right? You know, the Thomas is the dog is being acted upon right, by Thomas. The dog is passive. The subject is passively undergoing something. Whereas Thomas feeds the dog, Thomas is actively doing something to the object, the dog. Right? Um, there are issues with the passive. I mean, is uh, part of part of the mindset with style is verbs are good, action is good. We'll see later. Concrete language is good. Action moves the brain forward. 
pushes thoughts forward. That's what the brain wants to have this experience. A verb, the state of verbs, am, is, are, was, or were, stop the flow of thought. We have to do this. I do, I use these all the time. I, I write more theoretical things. And you're really at risk of am, is, are, was, worrying somebody to death. And you know that you're giving the reader's brain no action. You are not pushing thought forward. And you have to do that, but you have to awareness, okay, man, if I get a chance to give an active verb or something here, I've got to... I've got to give the reader something, right? And if you just know in general that that brain is going to work better with if you push it forward with action, that that's what it wants, and you, you give that verb, it's both going to be comprehended better, it's going to be a more pleasurable experience, and it's actually been shown to be more persuasive. People aren't persuaded by things when they're struggling to make it through it. But when it sounds right, it seems right. So your writing is going to improve a lot. Um, there's also the idea that uh, this does tend to bring unnecessarily pre prepositions and nominalizations. So throughout this, the things that we say don't do, they all tend to bring each other. Whereas making a good choice, particularly with the verb, this book right here by... Pinker, he has a chapter in here, and his whole theory is that if you get the right verb, every other thing falls into place. And he's like a cognitive psychologist, where he's studied it way deeper than we want to. And he's convinced if you get the verb right, you're going to get all these other things are going to happen. But by the same token, it does seem to, you know, when I teach these sort of sentences and we go over them, once you get one error tends to bring, another error tends to bring, they feed each other. And by the same token, the right choices tend to bring the stylistically preferred actions as well. So it's it seems to be interconnected. The other the other thing is that some people make a big deal that you know the passive voice avoids any agency. I think the famous quote was, uh, "You guys may be a little young, you know, things happen." I think that was Bush said that. Um, it's not that I did something, right? You know, this, this happened to us. I've noticed a lot in my own life if I'm arguing with somebody or if I've done something wrong. Just watch. It tends to be in the passive voice to where I'm not, what I'm not saying is, you know, I did this or I took responsibility. It's that something happened to me. Right? And so if you're writing in certain circumstances, memos, legal contacts, whatever, it can raise a certain issue. And that's one reason why people like the active more, because you're going to know who, who did it, where it's seen as avoiding responsibility when you don't, uh, when you don't, when you use the passive. <clears throat> All right, this is sort of related to active verbs and passive verbs, and strong verbs and weak verbs. You know, weak verbs are, the, the am, is, are, was, were are a big deal. We have uh, Helen Sword has a book, The Writer's Diet. You can Google this, and Helen Sword, Writer's Diet, and you can actually plug your text in there, and it'll give you a readout of these six different categories and to detect how flabby your prose is. It's kind of interesting. She says it doesn't teach writing. It let me know that I tended to have a, you know, uh, certain things. Um, but I think the first category is am, is, are, was, were verbs stated, right? There's no, there's no motion. And you have to use them, but at least let me know if I've, you know, if my score is 90 on this, then I, it's probably not going to be read that well. Um, <clears throat> there's a you can, when I wrote my dissertation, I had a list of verbs to decide. I, I had Bloom's Taxonomy. When I taught at a certain institution, I used to make it my syllabus, and I do the learning object objectives. There was actually a list of approved verbs. Because they were all strong verbs. It couldn't be weak, because that's what you were promising to teach. You couldn't say, you know, we'll understand. <clears throat> that was considered too weak. <clears throat> Excuse me. They wanted a precise statement, right? So, verb, they needed a, what was the exact action that you were going to do? Um, the other thing I would say is you can Google strong verbs and weak verbs. It's not just a subjective thing. There are some, a lot of it I think even has to do with sound, 
Some of it has to do with definition. Um, some of them are debated, but you, you can get the feel for it. A good, strong verb is hard to be. The brain likes strong verbs, and it likes, we'll see in a minute, concrete language. If you can feed those things, because, you know, writing styles a lot about choices, which we could say are trade-offs, <clears throat> you know, those are wins. Very rare instances, you know, if you can, any, almost any time you do that, you're going to ding their brain. One way to look at it. <clears throat> so, Janet Smith is the supervisor of the customer service department. You can see there's a little bit of weightiness there with the prepositional phrase being introduced of the customer service department. Janet Smith supervises the customer service department. It's sharp. It's lively. It ends up reducing the number of words. You lose the the in front of supervisor and you lose the prepositional phrase. And it communicates everything you need to communicate. Stylistically, it's a better sentence. The dog, Janet Smith has a dog that barks all the time. <clears throat> Janet Smith's dog barks all the time. Again, you lose the uh, A and you lose the that and you get a strong verb. You give the reader's brain an action. Win, win, win. You made the winning choices. Oh, okay. Um, I've been <clears throat> already mentioned a couple times. Uh, if you write a narrative essay, this will often be uh, come up. Use concrete over abstract language. Uh, well, what is concrete in abstract languages? He was given an award for his courage. What color is courage? What does it smell like? What does it feel like when you touch it? Well, I have no idea. Why not? Because it's an abstract idea. It's not something you can point pick out and point at in the world. <clears throat> Perhaps more importantly, it's not something a reader's brain forms an image of. It doesn't do anything. If you had it hooked up to some sort of machine, it wouldn't, just the way I kind of imagine it, you know, it wouldn't light up. I'm turning off somebody's brain. As you know, somebody who has a background in philosophy and writes theory, I'm conscious of this a lot. I'm abstract. <clears throat> Sometimes it can just mean that you need to give an example. If you're talking about justice or something and you really think you're saying a lot, they're not going to really understand what you mean unless you say, well, you know, by justice, I mean helping students, disadvantaged students pay for college tuition that will benefit their children and their families in generations to come. Those were a bunch of concrete nouns. Okay, I, I haven't. They're talking about paying for college, you know. Um, so it, it serves that purpose as well. Um, time is abstract. Happiness is abstract. Something like a door or a phone is, con is is concrete. You can point at it in the world. You can imagine it in the brain. I had to give a commencement speech one time, and I knew that even in the introduction, and. and um, to go for concrete language, just to start talking about the pictures that were going to be hung up on the wall, the, the, the memories, the things, you know, the diploma in the bed, you know, in the office, the whatever. I mean, I just started enumerating concrete language because I was just trying to engage the reader, the audience, and not bore them. And I knew to just start giving them concrete images, right? So you, as a writer, you understand some of these things, but you just you need to know if you, for, as a general rule, prefer it, that it's precise, that it gives the reader's brain a lively thought, right? And those lively thoughts, when they're pushed forward with verbs, and you're well on the way to a well-written, you know, good, good style. All right, unnecessary nominalization. So the way one editor used to tell me that he used to read, you know, graduate students and professional, you know, PhDs papers, and they would be in a room and they would just start screaming, liberate the verb, please. Somebody, please liberate the verb. There's an action in there somewhere. And for us theoretical types, this can be a big deal. A nominalization is taking an action, which we've already said, like, that's a, desirable thing in writing and you make a trade-off you took something that was active and lively and you put it into a noun 
which stops the flow of thought. It's a thing. And usually that's a bad trade-off. You're wanting to move the reader's thoughts forward, right, in a lively fashion. The noun's going to weigh down your prose. Right? So um, this is often attributed with like bureaucratic speech, they call it, or like lawyers or writing that's just, you know, not good writing um, with a lot of buzzwords and jargon. Destabilization, you know, um, there, there's a nice strong verb there, destabilized. Ecosystem destabilization can be the consequence of invasion. Invasion can destabilize ecosystems. Sharper sentence. More information, same amount of information, less work. Um, you got you got an opportunity to use a strong verb, usually you take it. A conclusion was reached. We brought the passive in too. That often happens. That pH determined the rate. We concluded that pH determined the rate. Demonstration. Again, you got a nice strong verb there named demonstrate. You probably want to think about unleashing it. Liberate the verb. Liberate the action. It's buried in there. It's, it's, it's imprisoned in a thing. Let out the action. These sort of mindset things I find are sort of are helpful. And, um, and finally, sentence variety um, is the sixth item for good style. You can subject verb object somebody to death. That's one way to think about it. You just know that. You know a lot. I remember I was teaching technical writing. They actually had some study that was done where they had like five five-word sentence that were subject, verb, object in a row, and they'd give it to people. And then part of the result was nobody could remember it. It, it literally bored and shut down the brain. That Our brain, the, the, the conclusion was, craves a certain amount of variety. Right? You know, you just start watching a movie, and it just kind of plods along and doesn't give you any twist or turn or anything unexpected to kind of jolt your attention you probably turn off the movie as well. Well, readers turn off what they're reading, right? Um, we should have sentence variety. If you learn the sentence patterns, if you commit to a front of an index card and you do the work, you'll solve that problem, right? And with all the stuff that's discussed here, I emphasize throughout the course, uh, I mean, a lot of it's gonna be, I mean, I, I'm a guide. I can give a blueprint to building a house, but you gotta go pick up a hammer. It's just you can give somebody a workout program. You can give somebody this. But if you spend five, ten minutes looking up, right, nominalizations, right, looking up style. I just got done before I made the presentation. There's there's thousands of web pages on this. You may not be able to tell the difference between a sentence that has this you know, good style and a sentence that has bad style. In the beginning, I couldn't. But if you start looking at these pages enough after a while, I guarantee you, you will be. And then you'll know what good style is and you'll make those choices in your writing. But, um, you know, it's here's a musical scale. Right. You, got, you know, here, here's a blueprint. You know, um, this is what it means. But it, actually engaging it, doing it. Some people draw pictures. Some people write out the sentences themselves. Some people when you do that, it can become yours. If it doesn't do that somehow you have to make it yours and it doesn't have to be a lot. I mean, we're talking about a half a dozen things here. Look at them, understand them. When you start reading blogs or reading Facebook posts, see choices, look at the verbs that are made, see if there's a transition between a sentence. I know it sounds a little crazy, but you just were surrounded by language. Just start looking at how language is used and get into language using game. And if you do that one, well, you know, it's, it's going to happen. Eventually, it's going to happen. You're going to get good at it. If you don't do that, it's going to be really hard to get good at it because you're just not looking at the things in those terms. You're not orienting yourself towards it. So here's a summary of six things that you can do. And again, you look at it, especially if you're going to write, you don't have to do that this semester. You write a 10-page paper. This is really going to ask a lot of your audience. You're going to need to have some good habits not to bore people, right? You're going to have some good habits to deliver that amount of information for the audience to let you take their time 
you you're going to have to treat them right. It's like if you're going to spend an hour with somebody, you better be fairly interesting, right? You better not bore them or they're going to want to leave. And that's one way to look at it. A lot of this is about attention. Um, how not to abuse a, some, a reader's attention and how to treat their attention uh, in the best way possible. But you can think of these as habits. you you got to somehow start to internalize these. Initially, it, maybe it just comes in on the editing process. But eventually, yeah, you know, you, you, you kind of do these things in your writing. And again, I think part of it is the mindset. We could call this attitude. You know, writing's not different than anything else. We talk about habits and attitude. But just, I have the impression that I know when I was first writing, I was not trying to do this, or I was not pushing myself to do this, or editing. I was not oriented towards, you know, styling my sentences to give the most meaning for the fewest amount of words or um, not wasting words, making every word count, right? Um, but once I started competing in this arena, I got better at it. But I was, you know, I had to be ori I had to be in there trying to do that or understanding, you know, what am I doing when I, what does it mean to have good style before it could happen? So just simply having the awareness that this is what your task is as a writer. This is what you're trying to do. If you do it well, people are going to say it's well written. If you do it poorly, people are going to turn around and say it wasn't well written. So, again, just if the mindset is the most meaning for the smallest amount of work on the part of the reader, nothing's worse than working unnecessarily. You know, it took me three hours to cut this grass because the lawnmower kept stopping up. Right? Man, I thought it was going to take 45 minutes. Um, another way to look at it is the smooth and lively flow of thoughts in the reader's brain. I use this reader's brain metaphor because it works for me. Concrete language will light it up. You know, um, verbs will connect the thoughts. It'll be flowing. Thought will be going. Nouns will arrest it. Right? Uh, these are your tools. Um, stative verbs. Am, is, are, was, were. Provide no action. Um, so just if you understand that that's the game that's being played here, that alone can push you towards styling better sentences. You'd probably be, you know, likely to do many of the specific techniques that we, you know, that we enumerated in this presentation. All right. So these are the basics. I don't think there are exceptions in every case because then this is writing. This is not a science. There's. For a hundred years, there have been agreements. These are probably the, you know, the half dozen things that you'll find in any writing book uh, that would fall under style. It's not grammatical correctness. It's not transition. It's its own sort of animal. And if you start doing these things and start making it a habit, <clears throat> I'm very confident, you know, that your writing is going to improve. I mean, I still go over my work. I still, but. This is the gateway into better sentences. If you purge yourself of these sort of bad errors like nominalization, unnecessary phrases, 12-word sentences that should be seven, you start taking all these things out and you start using you know, strong verbs and you start using active voice, you start doing that, you will see a marked improvement on your papers. Uh, English, sometimes it's hard to find agreement. People think you're great, but there, there's a broad consensus not a consensus of opinion, that this works. So that's why we needed to get into this. I needed to say something about this. Um, you will see an improvement in your writing if you can incorporate these principles.